All right, I think we're on. So uh, hi, everyone, and uh, welcome to this session. My name's Andreas, and uh, for the next 20 minutes, I'll be talking about some work I've been doing on using FoundationDB as a storage engine for Ermin. Now, uh, I assume that most of you won't be familiar with Ermin, so I'll spend the first bit of time just providing some context about what Ermin is, and then afterwards, I'll dive into more detail about how this storage engine functions and interacts with FoundationDB. So Ermin is a distributed database library, or you could also call it a very configurable database. It's an open source project that originates from the Unikernel ecosystem, so that's applications that run directly on top of the hypervisor using a library operating system instead of the traditional software stack. So that means that Ermin makes very few assumptions about the host environment, and it can run both as a, in, as a unikernel, as part of a unikernel, it can run in a Unix-like environment, or it can even run in the browser. Um, the first version of Ermin was co-developed while writing uh, the next version of SenseStore-D, which is the uh, data store uh, responsible for storing configuration data for VMs running on top of uh, the Sen hypervisor. You may know Sen as uh, the kind of underpinning of many uh, uh, virtual private server offerings, such as Amazon CC2. And since Sen is written in OCaml, Ermin is, is also written in OCaml. So the problem that Ermin is trying to solve is allowing a network of nodes to share state while emphasizing that each node uh, is autonomous and should be able to make progress independently without necessarily uh, being able to, to uh, contact each other, that there is fine-grained control of when to share state between the nodes and have that be quite explicit, and auditing for the sake of monitoring and debugging the system. With Ermin, every node has a local, possibly partial replica of the database, and rather than continuously agreeing on the shared state, each node can, can run independently, and then it's up to the user of Ermin to actually push and pull data between the nodes. So compared to, May, compared to FoundationDB, Ermin has made a very different set of trade-offs. To solve these problems, Ermin has taken a lot of inspiration from Git, and Git is super popular in the source control management world, uh, and many of you probably use it daily but I would also imagine that you don't really consider it a, a data store, a database, right? It's something you use to manage your code. Um, but to explain Ermin, it's actually easiest to go back to Git and just review the basics, and then we'll kind of translate that back to what it means uh, in terms of a database. So on the surface, the model that Git provides is a mapping from paths to file contents. So in this simple example, uh, docs slash readme.md maps to the contents of that file, which is simply a, a blob of bytes. So this is quite similar to a typical key value store, but a little bit richer since you have the concept of folders, right? Git does not only store the current contents of files, but also the full history of changes that list uh, that led up to that point. So we have this concept of commits, where a set of changes is bundled up into a single entity, and also contains metadata about uh, what happened there, what's the description of the changes, an author, and so on. And actually, as you probably know, Git allows multiple versions of this paths to contents mappings to exist in the form of branches, where each branch or originate from a particular commit and can later be merged into a branch to combine these two mappings. So this means that the, the um, the commits actually form a, a directed acyclic graph of changes. Under the covers, Git stores data in these two separate stores, and one is an append-only content addressable store that where uh, it contains all the file contents, trees, and commits. And when modifying data, you never override or touch any of the existing entries. You always create new things. So that's all, how all the revisions of the store is preserved. Using content addressing, you can lower the space overhead of this, and you can also use DOSA compression 
to make this more efficient. Branches, on the end, are kept in the mutable store because those will actually continuously be updated to point to new revisions in the append-only store. So that's how the contents of a branch changes, but uh, a tree or a commit never changes contents. So how does this description of Git fit with the problems that we set out to solve with Ehrman? Well, you might consider a development team to be the set of nodes trying to collaborate on a code base, which is the shared state. Each developer can work autonomously on uh, the code base, even without a network connection. Synchronizing between developers is a matter of pushing and pulling data to each other. And any file in the code base can be explained by a sequence of annotated changes. So this is how uh, Git actually fits re really well with the problems that Ehrman set out to solve. And in many ways, this description of, of Git carries over to Ehrman. Ehrman is similarly mapping from paths to values with commits, branches, merges, etc. This also means that all these benefits and characteristics we just described uh, also fit for, for Ehrman. And Ehrman is actually compatible with Git to the point uh, that the on-disk format and the network protocol works with Ehrman as well. So you can clone a Ehrman database to your local uh, laptop and use Git log to inspect it, for example. However, Ehrman diverges from Git in a couple of important ways to emphasize being a database, not a source control management system. So Git is designed for storing source files modified by humans at a low rate with semi-automatic merges, while Ehrman must store application-specific values modified by applications at a much higher rate of change, and you can't have a programmer to come and, and fix it when there is a conflict. And this idea around not just storing blobs of bytes, but actually application-specific values is, is one of the, the key features of Ehrman. So we'll talk a little bit more, more about that. So I'm sure you've all experienced merge conflicts in, in Git, and uh, merge conflicts can similarly happen in Ehrman when you merge two branches. And since there's no programmer to, to solve it, it has to happen programmatically. And in foundation DB, a value is just a, a blob of bytes, right? You, we don't know anything about it. Uh, but this is slightly different in, uh, in Ehrman. So as a user of Ehrman, you actually have to define a three-way merge function between the least common ancestor and the two conflicting values. And this can either result in this being merged nicely into a new value, or it can conflict and you can have an error message. So to build a little bit of intuition, here's a, a, a brief example where the application-specific value is simply a number. You can consider this a counter of some sorts. And there are two branches that have, been, that have diverged on what the value should be, and this has resulted in a conflict. So maybe you're thinking, what's the, what's the proper way to address this? Here's at least one way that it could be solved which is summing the two new values and subtracting the old value. And this will indeed give uh, the result eight, which agrees with our intuition that if six has been incremented four times and decremented two times, then you get the number eight. So this is a super simple example of an application-specific value, but you can have something much more complex like uh, mergeable queues, mergeable ropes, or something else that fits whatever application you're writing. A final observation here is that if you have a merge function that never conflicts, then you have something that's equivalent of a CRDT, a conflict-free replicated data type. So as previously mentioned, Ehrman makes very few assumptions about the host environment, and one of the ways this shows is by having a pluggable storage engine. So there's already a number of such engines for storing on disk, in memory, in Redis, and even in IndexedDB in the browser. And this is where this work on, uh, with FoundationDB comes in. So uh, essentially what I've written is a, uh, a storage engine called um, ErmanFDB. Uh, so let's, let's look uh, more closely at that. So the first step of actually implementing this storage engine was uh, creating uh, bindings for FDB in OCaml. 
And in case you're not familiar with OKMO, it's a statically typed functional programming language, quite similar to Haskell, but with strict evaluations, uh, strict evaluation and imperative features. So uh, despite being, you know, not that a little bit uh, esoteric, maybe for some people, uh, Foundation DB and the API fit quite nicely uh, using closures to kind of automatically retry failed uh, commits and asynchronicity fits really well with monads. Um, the tricky part about kind of implementing these, these bindings have been about the interaction with the garbage collector, which I think is an observation that many of the other bindings uh, share. So implementing a uh, storage engine for, for Emin is, for the most part, quite simple. This is kind of the first half of uh, the signature that you must uh, implement. Uh, for a storage engine, which is simply checking whether a key is present in the store, finding the value of a key, setting a key to a particular value, removing a key, listing the keys in the store, and finally a test and set operation. Uh, and, and most of these are, are quite straightforward to map to Foundation DB, the most complex being test and set, in particular because kind of the uh, quality function is not comparing the serialized versions of the data, but it's actually a user provided a quality function over the application specific value. But using transactions, is, it's fairly simple, just start a transaction, get the, get the value, compare and otherwise set. So yeah, transactions save the day yet again. The second part of implementing a search engine is around watches. So similar to Foundation DB, Ehrman has a notion of watches. Uh, and you can actually both watch a single key and the entire key space. And there's also the caveat that you need to be able to, you need to provide the value at the time uh, that this was triggered, uh, which is unlike the watches in Foundation DB that just tells you something has changed. Uh, but you don't know uh, how the value changed. Uh, so this is uh, something that has to happen in the storage engine and, and is not uh, kind of easily handled by Foundation DB. So we'll look at, in, in more detail at, at how to handle watching the entire key space, which is the most tricky. And this is a use case that's come up also a couple of other times today, kind of how to handle these change feeds. So it, here's at least one take on it. So there's a special key called here uh, K watch all, uh, which is uh, used to notify changes. And then there's the, the range of keys here, VS1 one, one and, and uh, VS2, uh, which is a log of the actual changes. So here uh, K1 and is the key that changed. And uh, V1 uh, describes how it's changed. So when uh, creating a, uh, an ermine watch, uh, the watcher starts, uh, creates an FDB watch for the special key K watch law and finds the end of the log and maintains this internal cursor. Um, whenever ermine then mutates data, it atomically increments K watch law and adds a, a version stamp to the change log with a description of what changed. So this uh, entire thing happens in a single transaction and the watcher will then be notified and can replay changes uh, from its internal cursor until the end of the change log. So as described so far, this solution will accumulate, uh, this change log will grow indefinitely uh, so there is a time configurable interval um, after which the change log will be uh, cleaned up again. Um, this could be made more efficient if the watcher is actually kept state in Foundation DB, but that doesn't happen right now. An entirely different approach to this, which is made, um, which is possible because the entire history of the store is actually already stored. Um, in Foundation DB would be to, to leverage that instead. Um, that I haven't explored that uh, at this point. This solution has the drawback of amplifying write volume, but on the other hand, it makes uh, watches really efficient. Uh, so there's a bit of a trade-off there. So right now, the storage engine uh, passes kind of the very extensive Ehrman test suite, and there's preliminary benchmarks that show it's uh, comparable to the other engines, though 
the workloads that the current ermin benchmark suite contains does not really kind of exploit that the engine is horizontally scalable, so it doesn't kind of shine in that sense. Um, but it's definitely showing promise. And then uh, also further work on the OCaml FDB bindings. Uh, in particular, I want them to pass the binding test, which they don't at this point. But it, it's, it's uh, quite a lot of work to pass everything. So from the perspective of Foundation DB, you can consider this to be like a Git layer that allows you to store and interact uh, with data in, in your cluster via Git. And actually, we have a you know, perfect inception opportunity here because the source code for Foundation DB could be stored in Foundation DB, right? Uh, seems like we, we can't miss that one. For Ermin, there are some really interesting perspectives in having a horizontally scalable uh, storage engine. Uh, first of all, it will allow a node in the, in the network, in the cluster, to kind of play a high traffic role in the same sense that GitHub's uh, replica of your Git repo uh, serves a very different purpose to the Git repo that you have on your local laptop. And, and this, this really enables that use case. Secondly, there's this idea to introduce tiered storage in Ermin. So a node can have only a limited uh, amount of the history uh, locally on disk, and then it can fail the rest, fetch the rest of the history from a remote storage such as uh, Foundation DB. But otherwise, uh, a great next step is to have one of the industry users of Ermin adopt Ermin FDB. I think that would, would really drive the project forward. And with that, thanks for listening. You can find all the source code on GitHub. <laughs>